live from the world headquarters of RT America in our nation's capital, this is the news with Rick Sanchez. And hello again, everybody. I'm Rick Sanchez. Tonight, as the U.S. Senate grapples with how long, what rules, and how many witnesses are going to be allowed to testify in the president's uh, impeachment trial, uh, an even more important, much less transparent, even mysterious body is preparing to make decisions that will affect our future in ways that will surpass. Think about this. Anything that the Senate may do or not do regarding impeachment. The Federal Reserve and its members who sit on a committee that sets policies for things like interest rates, they're coming together again. Their goal is this, to prevent or try to minimize the very thing that key indicators, metrics, and economists say is heading our way. A global recession said to be staring at us, much in the same way that the iceberg lay in wait for the Titanic. And like the Titanic, some say it may be too late to change course. So what can actually be done then, right? You see, so in the old days, under normal circumstances, we would take the hit. Recessions happen, right? Things go up and down. And the natural laws of economics, supply, demand, would navigate us through the torment at some point. No, these are not normal times. The Federal Reserve has already, key here, already artificially manipulated the market so severely that there's little room for a reprieve. It has printed money seemingly out of thin air, lowered interest rates, encouraging me, you, the government, corporations to borrow and borrow and borrow like never before. Because you see, if we don't borrow and consume almost irresponsibly, the economy then collapses. So what is the result then? The result is the public debt, student debt, corporate debt, beyond imaginable, which leads us to the very reasons that we're leading with this story today, and it is this. So central bankers, those unelected, unelected, but very connected elite bankers who care much more about their brethren than they do about you or me, are about to set policy for this year. Got it? They're setting the policy for 2020. Remember, last year, they printed money and gave it to banks to cover their debts. We reported that here first, right? We broke it. They also lowered interest rates to encourage more and more borrowing. They did that during a robust economy. So what are they going to do now? The signals point to more borrowing, more printing, and even lower interest rates. How low can they go? Signs right now point to something previously incomprehensible, that the United States of America, the United States economy, will actually move interest rates into negative territory. Negative territory. Negative interest rates. Why would they do that? And what's it really mean to you? We're all over this story. This is the news with Rick Sanchez, where, by golly, we believe it's time to do news again. All right, here's the uh, list of questions that we think you're going to be asking tomorrow. Expect more debt and even lower interest rates? Can our economy sustain that? Was a chemical attack in Syria really all about propaganda? Are you okay with Amazon getting the okay to access your medical records? But let's go ahead and begin with the very latest on what uh, economic insiders call a scary proposition. The notion that our central bankers will continue to artificially manipulate the economy by printing money, by the way, out of thin air, 
and lowering interest rates to unimaginable percentages. All this while insisting that the economy's in great shape, better than ever. Really? Now, there's even talk of an even more extreme move on the horizon, interest rates below zero. That's the key point. RT correspondent John Huddy starts us off tonight. At the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, President Trump said something that didn't exactly dominate the headlines, but is a big story nonetheless, that he loves negative interest rates. As the mainstream media here in the United States focuses on the president's impeachment trial, the president's comments during his speech in Davos is certainly one that has piqued the interest of world economists and financial experts. The president said that he, quote, could get used to negative interest rates, adding, even now, as the United States is by far the strongest economic power in the world, it's not even close. We're forced to compete with nations that are getting negative rates, something very new, meaning they get paid to borrow money, something I could get used to very quickly. Love that. This isn't the first time President Trump has praised the use of negative interest rates, saying last week the concept was, quote, incredible. But the president's comments stand in contrast to his own top economic advisor, Larry Kudlow, who said during a panel discussion in Davos that negative interest rates are not a good idea. They're really bad for banks. They're really bad for savers. They're not great for investors. The dichotomy between the president and his top economics guy is a pretty good representation of the debate over negative interest rates, which have taken hold in Europe in the wake of the financial crisis there, part of attempts by central banks to stimulate growth. But economists remain divided over whether negative interest rates really do have a stimulating effect on economies. One thing we know is the effect on consumers. When the Fed cuts interest rates, consumers usually earn less interest in their savings accounts. The U.S. Central Bank hiked interest rates four times in 2018. The last hike contributed to a massive sell-off in December 2018, sparking criticism from President Trump. Last year, the Fed cut rates three times. Going into 2020, Forbes reports that the Fed perceives its outlook for interest rates to be, quote, broadly neutral, though in the second half of 2020, it's possible the Fed could cut rates once again. So while the Fed's outlook on interest rates may be neutral, we know the president certainly is not. For the news with Rick Sanchez, John Huddy. Good stuff. Good report, John. Kind of clears it up, right? And joining us now to try and analyze all of this is uh, John Grace, the founder of Investors Advantage. Who He tends to be a nonconformist when it comes to market strategies, by the way. John, thanks so much for joining us. To me, I'm not an expert, maybe like you are, but it seems absolutely insane that in the United States of America, we would be considering something like negative interest rates, which essentially says to Americans, don't save any money, don't do anything but consume, get debts, uh, go in debt, and uh, spend irresponsibly. Am I wrong? Oh, no, you're 100 percent, Rick. And I mean, you know, I'm saying batten down the hatches because what has been called the best economy ever could well turn out to be the turbulent 20s. All right. No different than how we started the 1920s, right? The roaring 20s that ended in the Great Depression. So stay tuned. Uh, it's going to get interesting, but I don't think it's going to be pretty. I want to show you something. Look at this graph. OK, this graph shows something that I think is really interesting. And I think this is what it maybe at the root of the problem. That blue line, okay, that represents stocks, the investors, the less than 10% of America. The red line represents the other 90% of America, working stiffs like the rest of us, okay? Uh, as the economy has done well, look at how well the blue line does and look at how not so well the red line does. That's wages for Americans. Tell, tell us why that's important, John. Well, I mean, it helps to put in perspective, Rick, I, from what I just saw yesterday, is it true that 22 billionaires 
have a higher net worth than the total wealth for all women in Africa. Africa, that's a, that's a that's a you know not a not a country. That's a, a continent. A, a, <laughs> thank you. It's a continent. Thank you. It's a big one. It's a lot of people. Yeah. So it just helps us see how the one percenters are doing fantastic. As you say, the rest of us not so well. And when we look at uh, as I had a conversation with the you know minimum wage rising by all of four percent. Let's understand if I'm not mistaken, uh, the federal minimum wage is all of $7.25. If you run that out for 40 hours a week, 52 weeks in a year, I think that's about $15,000 a year. $15,000, a 4% increase on $15,000 is what, $600? That's not, a, that's not a week, it's not a month. That's $50 a month. So while it may sound good for the folks in those situations, it, it's no fun. The, the parade is not being enjoyed by all. So what I'm concerned about, I don't want a recession. You don't want a recession. Uh, certainly a global recession, but my biggest concern is that all the indicators do point to the fact that one is coming and that we're not going to have the tools that are necessary to get us out of it because we've used them all up. <laughs> This is true, and as I say, I, I suggest to people, look, and, and recognize when people talk about depression, they're, they're fearful. I'm saying don't be fearful, be factual, and be ready, all right? If you look at Great Depression one, the economy took a, a nosedive, right? Stocks came down, New York real estate came down. Both took maybe 20 to 40 years to get back to even. So let's act as if this one's going to happen. The good news about Great Depression one, Rick, is that on a per capita basis, more Americans became millionaires than any other time mm. in history. So for those who have the cash, not the equity, right? Cash is king. What do they say about equity? Crickets. When you've got the cash, you can see prices come down, and you can take advantage of those lower prices, maybe even at the bottom, and catch the next wave, as opposed to what I think is going to uh, turn out to be shock and awe for so many people, because they weren't ready for this one at all. Yeah, but what about the average guy who's just making a buck, barely getting by? If he were to lose his job, they say the average American has about $400 left over if they were to lose their job. That guy can't be thinking about how I'm going to make money if there's a recession. He's barely getting by, John. Well, this is absolutely true. And if we go back, this is from Pew Research, Rick, and we look at 2009, what I see is that the average decline for Caucasians was 17 percent. The decline at that point in time for African Americans was 53 percent. And for Latino Americans, Rick, yeah. the decline was 66 percent. So let's just notice, 17 percent, you won't have any trouble getting back to even. 50, 60, 70 percent or close to that, you're not even back in the same arena you were just 10 years ago. That's great stuff, John. Grace, as usual, uh, my thanks to you, sir, for uh, sharing some of your uh, knowledge and wisdom with us. Appreciate it. My pleasure, Rick. Now, here's something now that should uh, concern you. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that Microsoft and Amazon have just been uh, given access to your hospital records. No, we're not talking about, like, general records, general information about big groups of uh, people and their data. We're talking about identifiable hospital records, like your stuff, right, with your name on it. This is crucial, but controversial as a step in the big move to try and marry big tech with healthcare data. NRS Special Correspondent Michelle Greenstein joins us now to uh, bring us the details on this story. This is a little, uh, it's a little worrisome. Absolutely. And if you think about it, these hospitals are essentially data mines. There's a lot of important information in there. We're talking about deals with Microsoft, with Google, with IBM. And the Wall Street Journal says that these new agreements reflect a powerful new role that hospitals can play. They say this, that the rapid digitization of health records and privacy laws enabling companies to swap patient data have positioned hospitals as the primary arbiter of how such sensitive data is shared. So this is a powerful role for hospitals. Now, one example mm. is Providence, which is a hospital system that hosts the data Data of about 20 million patient visits a year. They have a deal with Microsoft where they use medical records to develop cancer algorithms. Sounds great, right? Mm -hmm. But even Providence admits that the doctor's notes that are used are not being stripped of this personally identifiable data before being handed over to Microsoft. We're talking about social security numbers. We're talking about names of patients. Another example is Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is the second largest teaching hospital of Harvard Medical School. They have a 10-year agreement with IBM as of February of 2019, and they're doing 
doing this to develop, again, AI together. But again, Brigham and Women's is allowed to share this personally identifiable data according to people involved with the agreement. Mm. This is people who spoke with the Wall Street Journal. Now, another example is the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. They have a deal with Amazon Web Services with certain employees where they can access health information and they can also, again, identify individual patients. And of course, this is just the latest step. I think you hit the nail on the head when you say this story reflects, you know, the broader trend towards these tech companies obtaining medical data because we also have Google with hospital agreements that allow, again, the sharing of personally identifiable, med identifiable medical data. Let's talk about this for a minute and try and break it down for viewers to understand. Sure. I'm all for there being a tech component to medicine. I think it's great that a doctor could put a wristband on a patient and call them and say, hey, I'm going to monitor you and see how your BP is doing right now, or I'm going to take a check a diabetes score on you or something, right? So the idea that tech belongs in medicine is a good thing. Mm -hmm. The problem is these companies that you're mentioning that are the ones who are going to be the arbiters mm -hmm. of this new tech move. These are companies that make their money sharing information. Right. And these corporations... So they can't make money unless they're able to get Michelle stuff and then sell it to somebody else. That's my concern. Exactly. None of this is illegal, right? But there may be a cause for concern because it's all about how this data might be used. Right. And like you just alluded to, these corpora corporations represent the surveillance state. It's not just, you know, the government coming down and spying on you directly. These are corporations that have steady relationships with the U.S. government. I mean, Amazon Web Services, right, has a $600 million uh, cloud computing contract with the CIA. It also hosts all the data for the FBI, the State Department, the NSA, the Food and Drug Administration, the Center for Disease Control. So this is really important data that Amazon is in control of. And well, it's not what, just but, Amazon. But I got to tell you, though, I'm less concerned about them sharing it with the government than I am them sharing it with my employer. Sure. I, I don't want my boss to know that I have, uh, I don't know, whatever I have, some disease, right? right. Because he's not going to want to hire me next year when we come up for contract talks, right? Right, right. And I mean, look. Um, this is just the latest example, right? We have Google already having strong connections with the largest DNA database on Earth. We reported on this last week through the company 23andMe and through its co-founder, Sergey Brin. And through its other co-founder, right. right, Larry Page, this man is actually working on creating a universal flu vaccine. So we have these tech companies suddenly getting involved in our personal information. And Microsoft, you're not going to believe this, Microsoft actually wants your blood. Take a listen. Mm. Mosquitoes are the ultimate field biologists, taking blood samples from every animal they bite. Microsoft and its partners are using smart traps to capture mosquitoes and study the DNA they collect. With the cloud, what used to take 30 days now takes 12 hours. <laughs> now, of course, they say they want your blood because, you know, you can detect these diseases before they spread. But again, this represents the surveillance state. And according to the government, you know, your hospitals are supposed to, uh, are required to notify patients before they share their data, but they're not required to ask permission. And they're also required to share the minimum amount of data possible. But if you're trying to make an algorithm or an app where you need to search a database and identify an individual patient, then the minimum required data can be all data on each patient. Michelle Greenstein, good work. Thank you for Thank that you. report. Tonight, we want to uh, examine what really happened in the Syrian city of Douma back in 2018. Conventional wisdom created by media consensus was that the Assad government used it against its own people. But tonight, the United Nations has looked into this, re-examined the attack, and facts may not be as they once appeared. Here is RT's Caleb Maupin with this story. The United Nations convened a meeting in which the results of the OPCW's investigation into the alleged chemical attack in the Syri Syrian city of Douma in 2018 was discussed. Now, that report from the o OPCW has come into question after information was revealed, leaks uh, cited that crucial evidence was essentially left out of that final report, and that crucial evidence that was left out could have pointed toward the attack being staged. Ian Henderson, who was a weapons inspector, he participated with the OPCW in their fact-finding mission in Duma. He doesn't agree with that. Um, he says that he pretty much, uh, based on the evidence, has concluded that the canisters uh, were placed uh, manually. They were not dropped from an airplane. This is what Ian Henderson said to the UN meeting, speaking through video link. This is what Ian Henderson said. The findings in the final FFM report were contradictory, were, were a complete turnaround with what the team had understood. Uh, collectively. 
uh, during and after the de du Duma deployments. And um, by the time of uh, uh, release of the interim report uh, in July 2018, our understanding was that we had serious misgivings that a chemical attack had occurred. Now, Ian Henderson is himself an expert on chemical weapons and the forensic investigations into them. Furthermore, he actually participated in the official OPCW investigation. But regardless, that did not stop certain voices from trying to cast doubt on what he said to the UN meeting. Take a listen. Mr. Henderson's papers appear to reflect a personal view. Of course, there are bound to be robust exchanges of views with voices differing from others in any scientific process. But what counts is the final considered assessment. Now, the Syrian government has been absolutely adamant and clear it had nothing to do with the chemical incident. Some countries led by the United States of America, continue to exceed the provisions of the Convention on the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons by politicizing the work of the OPCW and trying to derail from the track it was created for. That was the chemical incident, let's recall, in 2018, the alleged chemical incident in which uh, the Western countries, the United States and France, uh, they used that uh, as an opportunity to unleash 100 missiles against the Syrian government. They're had WikiLeaks publish a number of, of uh, leaks and information emails showing that there just was not unanimous agreement within the OPCW about who was responsible for the attack. Uh, based on that, uh, this report um, from the OPCW has been widely questioned. Allies of the United States seem to insist that the Syrian government is responsible and that the OPCW report uh, is conclusive and shouldn't be questioned. So once again, we have debate uh, over the chemical incident. I think that the Americans are going to continue to pretend as if uh, the evidence is clear and that it'll, it upholds their narrative. In effect, what we have is a final report, and then we also have these whistleblowers who are made up of the actual scientists. And the Americans are saying, we like the report, let's just move on. And the Russians are saying, wait a minute, let's listen to the actual scientists, because it sounds like the science didn't actually go into the final report. Uh, so honestly, both the Russians and Americans can say that they stand with the OPCW. It depends on whether you're talking about the report or the scientists who are pushing against it and saying that it doesn't actually represent their findings. Caleb Maupin reporting. Thank you for that report, Caleb. Tonight, there are protests in Puerto Rico caused by a bombshell discovery over the weekend. The findings have to do with relief supplies. RT correspondent Natasha Sweet has the details. Protesters are outraged over finding unused aid that's reportedly been sitting in a warehouse for nearly two weeks. This aid, which was supposed to help victims of Hurricane Maria, could have been utilized for the most recent quake that hit the island some two weeks ago. Hundreds of demonstrators gathered outside the seaside governor's mansion in San Juan Monday. Protesters are demanding for the governor's resignation after discovering forgotten disaster supplies amid continuing earthquakes. It's infuriating. I have never been to a protest, but this made me so mad, so angry. This hiding supplies and so many people dying. I think it's terrible. Residents in the city of Ponce broke into a warehouse over the weekend to find everything from bedding, food, water to medical supplies. It was all broadcast live on Facebook by a blogger. This led to the immediate firing of the director of Puerto Rico's Office of Emergency Management. Two other officials, the housing and family secretary, were fired Sunday. Governor Wanda Vasquez initially said it was, quote, unforgivable. These resources were kept in a warehouse. 
Now protesters are calling for her resignation. Meanwhile, the director of Puerto Rico's Office of Emergency Management denies mishandling the emergency supplies. In a statement, he said the aid was expired and no one had ordered for it to be removed. Now, this scene looks all too familiar in Puerto Rico. As you may recall, it was just last summer the former governor resigned for several reasons. One was undermining the death toll for Hurricane Maria. Reporting in Los Angeles, in Hush Suite, RT. Meanwhile, tonight, the World Health Organization is preparing to hold an emergency meeting tomorrow on the outbreak of a virus from China. This is called the Wuhan coronavirus. Wuhan coronavirus. It's already killed six people. And this afternoon, the very first case was reported right here in the United States. Rachel Blevins joins us with the latest. Health officials in the United States have confirmed that at least one American has contracted the mysterious virus that is believed to have originated from a market in China. A man is now being quarantined at the Providence Regional Medical Center in Everett, Washington, after he presented symptoms of pneumonia upon returning home from a visit to Wuhan, China. However, reports claim the man did not visit the animal market where the virus originated. The mystery illness is said to manifest in the form of a respiratory infection, and it has killed six people and has been contracted by at least 300 people. So far, the virus has impacted people in Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and it has spread outside of China to Taiwan, Japan, Thailand, and South Korea. Now, while health officials have confirmed that they believe the virus originated in Wuhan, China last month, they admit there is still a lot that is unknown about the outbreak. As one professor noted, quote, there are still more questions that we don't know the answers to than things we do know, such as what is the source? We don't know exactly. The location likely was from a live animal market, but we don't know what particular animal it was from. Now, as officials worldwide struggle to both identify and contain the mysterious virus, the World Health Organization is now warning that the coronavirus spreads quickly from human to human contact and that more cases are expected. Based on previous experience with respiratory illnesses and in particular with other coronavirus outbreaks and our analysis of data shared by China, human to human transmission is occur occurring. Meanwhile, scientists in Germany have developed the first diagnostic test to identify the new virus, but they are warning about its likelihood to spread ahead of the upcoming travel season in China. The situation at present, um, considering the, the upcoming travel season in China, is a serious one. And um, so they have to weigh and balance their, their decisions well. Um, I believe that, um, let's say, decision-making regarding travel restrictions, um, it is about time to, to be clear about this. Um, it is about time to have some support from the WHO for this. Well, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention here in the U.S. is now warning that the latest coronavirus has the potential to cause severe disease and even death. The World Health Organization plans to hold an emergency meeting on Wednesday to determine whether to declare an international public health emergency. In Washington, Rachel Blevins, RT. All right, thanks so much, Rachel, for that report. That's uh, our news. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. A lot going on as we get ready to start the week. And uh, we should let you know that if you have some friends looking for a newscast not like the rest, tell them we're here. And here is where we do news again.